Good morning. It's uh, good to be with you once again after being uh, out the last two weeks. We've had a couple of special events at our Sunday school class. And so today we're going to start uh, a two-part series as we begin Passion Week, as many people label this, as we talk about uh, things around uh, Resurrection Sunday. And so today, as we begin our study today, let's start with a word of prayer. And remember those who are hurting in a variety of ways, who may have illnesses or uh, a lot of other issues that's going on in our world, and just lift them up to you, up to the Lord today, that uh, he will give them peace and help them understand. And then help us also during this time of study that the Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us through this, this lesson today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We thank you for this time of year that we come and celebrate uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem, but knowingly that he was going to go to the cross at the end. And Father, as we study this event, uh, these events this week and next week, I just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us and help us to understand the magnitude of the things that uh, we, we are looking at and that Jesus did for each and every one of us. Father, we want to lift up those who are struggling in a variety of ways today and just pray your spirit will be with them. They'll feel your, your peace with them, that they'll just know that you're there and you care for them. We thank you for your words. He gives us truth and insight. And pray today, Father, as we open your word, that it will not come back void. Thank you for loving us, Lord, and just uh, open our hearts and our minds today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's such a beautiful weekend uh, this weekend, and uh, we've had some good weather in this, this springtime, and it's been nice and cool with low humidity. But as we start our lesson today, uh, we're going to have a two-part study, as, we, as I mentioned, uh, talking about uh, the Passion Week and, and things that happened in there. We uh, had, a, our last Sunday, we had someone come and talk about uh, the Passover and what it mean, means for the Jewish people. And it was pretty in-depth, and, and so it was pretty interesting. So we won't talk about that uh, this week or next week. We'll just uh, go right into a couple other events as we talk about the triumphal entry of the king in today's study. The event is recounted in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke frequently overlap in many of their presentations, and so we do not find ourselves surprised by their shared information. But to have an event shared also in John is less expected. Inclusions in all four Gospels speak to the importance of the triumphal entry. Now, several months before, Jesus had warned his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, including his own death, at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the scribes. Peter strongly resisted such an idea, though. He even rebuked Jesus. And the idea of Jesus dying was completely foreign to what Peter and the other disciples understood about Jesus' mission. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the disciples must have believed that their hopes of establishing Jesus as an earthly Messiah were about to be realized. <clears throat> Though the disciples did not yet understand, Jesus' death would fulfill the scriptures, just not as they had expected, though. The theme of the fulfillment of Scripture permeates Matthew's gospel. From Jesus' birth, Matthew both alluded to prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, and Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, when he wrote in Matthew 1, 1, in the beginning of his letter, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And he outright quoted it in Matthew 1, verses 22 through 23 when he said so all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet which was Isaiah saying behold the virgin shall be be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which translates God with us now Matthew spells out in his account of the triumphal entry that this event fulfills prophecy once and again, and pave the way for other fulfillments to come as well. Now, Matthew's book, uh, chapters 21 through 28, is devoted to the final week of Jesus' life through the resurrection and the post-resurrection appearances. That week that Matthew's talking about left the world changed forever. As a side note, as we deal with mysteries, 
in books or in movies, the reader or viewer tries to figure out who did it, along with the detective in the story. The best stories always have a surprising ending. Many of you may remember in the 1970s a show called Columbo, which turned this formula on its head. The viewer saw the murderer and knew the perpetrator from the very beginning, so the tensions came from the uncertainty of whether the case would be solved. Inspector Columbo, the detective that was played by Peter Falk, appeared to be a bumbling and dumb-witted inspector. However, he is quite good and, and a careful in investigator. Each episode followed how the inspector cracked the case, and at the end, Columbo revealed proof of the perpetrator's identity. Now, the proof of Jesus' identity is clear to us because we have all the evidence of history at our disposal. But to his disciples and the crowds, however, the mystery was intact. Who was Jesus? What was he going to do in Jerusalem? The triumphal entry is one part of the story on his way to the cross. As we look at the triumphal entry of the king. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11. We'll break it down into two parts. The first part is the preparation in verses 1 through 5. And the second part is the procession in verses 6 through 11. Let's look at the preparation, starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. As we know, Jesus and his disciples traveled uh, many places and, and with many other people, but they came to Jerusalem for the time to celebrate Passover. The people who lived in Jerusalem also were preparing for the feast and the influx of religious visitors. And Jesus arrived several days before the Passover, spending time in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in Bethany. But how many of you have ever heard of or know where Bethpage is, as mentioned in verse 1? Now the two small villages, Bethany and Bethpage, are on the eastern side of Jerusalem. Bethany serves as Jesus' normal base of operation when he was in Judea. Now, the villages were located about two miles to the east or southeast of Jerusalem, as I mentioned. Now, the group arrived at Bethpage, which is near Bethany, and the, it was in the Mount of Olives, which kind of runs north and south, <clears throat> that flanks the eastern side of Jerusalem. Bethany and Bethpage were on the far side of the mount, somewhat isolated from the city, yet conveniently close to it. Well, let's continue in verses 2 and 3 and see what happens. Of course, Jesus is going to start speaking here when he said, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey and, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord had need of them, and immediately he will send them. The two disciples that Jesus sent are not named, so we're not real sure which ones went. The expectation that the female donkey, which is also called a jenny today, was tied with her colt, indicating that the donkey was not out grazing or involved in any work, but ready and waiting for something that we now know was for Jesus. The owner probably wasn't aware of the need. The owner may have, uh, or the donkey may have been fitted with some type of halter that allowed her to be tied to the post, readily available for being led back to Jesus. Now, all four of the Gospels mention the younger donkey, but only Matthew includes the detail that there was an older female donkey as well. Jesus anticipated the disciples being asked about taking the donkeys and told his followers how to answer. And the answer was, the Lord needs them. When the day of the triumphal entry arrived, his plan was complete and in keeping with the Father's will. Now let's see what verse 4 says, in keeping with the Lord's will. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, and it stops right there. Now Jesus alluded to the prophet, which was Isaiah, I mean, excuse me, Zechariah, who prophesied concerning the king coming into Jerusalem. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. 
Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now there is perfect uh, conversions between the prophet who had been given the glimpse of God's plan and the Messiah who reacted, who enacted, excuse me, the plan centuries later. As we talked about in Matthew 1, earlier, when we were talking about Jesus' birth, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Even though that was talking specifically about the, the virgin birth, the same phrase can be used in other prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus during his time on earth. His prophecies and others were not fulfilled by random choice or chance. The events they foresaw were pieces of God's deliberate plan, a plan carried out by Jesus. Now verse 5 says, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt of the foal of a donkey. So there would be no mistake or ambiguity. Matthew recorded an abbreviated version of Zechariah's prophecy. Now during that time, Jerusalem was overflowing with Passover pilgrims. The feast temporarily would nearly double the Jerusalem's normal population. Now here was their king entering the royal city. Even though Jesus rode on an animal and was the object of such praise, his humility was actually on display. He was not riding a giant stallion with flaring nostrils, but a lowly donkey. The animal was used primarily for plowing or as a beast of burden, not to announce the presence of royalty. He is the humble king, a contradiction of terms in the ancient world, but perfect in God's plan. As we see this in his first coming, in his second coming, it's going to be quite different. Jesus won't come riding lowly on the foal of a donkey. Revelations 19 verses 11 through 16 gives a brief, a brief description of when Jesus comes the second time. Let's read it and take a look at it. It's quite different than his first coming. Verse 11 in Revelations 19 says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In verse 14, And the armies in the heavens, that's us, the redeemed, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a strong, a sharp sword that with, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Kind of gives me chill bumps just thinking about his second coming which could be uh, just around the corner. Now back to the triumphal entry, the first coming. We'll look at the second uh, section of scripture, verses 6 to 11, what we call the procession. Verses 6 and 7 state, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the coat, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. Now if you remember from the reading in John, Jesus and his disciples were in Bethany, at the house of Matthew, uh, excuse me, not Matthew, but Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. As our text stated in verse 1, they were on their way to Jerusalem, and when they got to Bethphage, Jesus sent the two disciples to get the donkey. Even though they weren't that far from Jerusalem, they still had about a mile or so to go. However, over and through the Mount of Olives. Now verse 8 states, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now Matthew knows of, of a crowd of many people when he talks, uh, records a couple of times about the people that Jesus fed. 
and the Passover crowd seemed to be even larger than those that he had recorded earlier. Speculations was buzzing about if and when Jesus would come. Jesus did not stir up the crowd. Their celebration was a spontaneous act by the people who had been anticipating his arrival. The nature of this event was contagious, and the crowd responded by paving the triumphal path of Jesus with their own clothes and with freshly cut branches. They also waved branches uh, as Jesus was going by. Normally, this behavior is reserved for somebody of royalty. Now, let me ask you a question. How would you react if somebody that you were uh, thought that was really, really famous in our lifetime today, if you had been put in charge with entertaining this individual for the weekend and making sure that they got wherever they needed to go and you would see crowds around uh, knowing that this person that you were delivering was somebody special, how would you react if you would see a scene like that in our times today? That's kind of what was going on there. People would just see, oh, so-and-so's here, and they were excited. And a lot of people may have gotten caught up in the excitement as well. As we continue in verse 9, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now those who went ahead came out of Jerusalem to meet him, and those that followed had come from Bethany with him. The acclamation of the multitudes has three parts, all pointing to Jesus as the promised Messiah. Hosanna is the first one to the son of David. The people's acclamation of Jesus as the son of David was a clear reference to God's promises to David and his lineage, even in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and also in Psalms chapter 89. And the Gospel of John makes this knowledge even more explicit, recording that the crowd also hailed Jesus as King of Israel. Now, the second one is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people at the triumphal entry clearly anticipated great things from a, a king who comes in the name of the Lord. But they did not yet realize or anticipate how Jesus' kingship would or appreciate his kingship would differ from every monarch they had ever known. Nor did they know Jesus' absolute worthiness, worthiness to receive praise and worship. The Pharisees understood the threat of the people's adoration, though, regarding their behavior as worthy of rebuke. Let's look at such a, uh, a sight in, in Luke chapter 19, verses 37 through 44. It says, Then as he was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the almighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And in verse 40, Jesus says, I tell you that if these keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And as he draw near, he saw the city and wept over it. In verse 42, saying, If you have known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days have come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surrounding you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in, uh, in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Describing the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus rebuking the Pharisees, saying that if he told his people, to be quiet, the stones would cry out. Now the third uh, indication of Jesus as Messiah in verse 9 is they cried out, Hosanna in the highest. Now the highest heavens refers to God's dwelling place. The people were asking God to hear them from his home and to act on their behalf. But little did they know that Emmanuel was this, with them right then. As we just read, Luke tells us that some of the religious leaders 
continued to demand that Jesus silence the enthusiastic crowd. But Jesus responded, as we just talked about, if they are quiet, then the stones will cry out. But Jesus continued to weep for the city because he knew what was about to happen. Not only his crucifixion, but what was going to happen later to the city and the temple. Jesus did not silence the people, but neither did he explain to them everything they didn't understand about him. Then as now, Jesus can truly be known only when we accept the truth that he was crucified, died, and then rose again from the grave. Jesus brought God's kingdom close, and as he showed through his life, death, and resurrection, that citizenship in his kingdom is different from that of an earthly nation. No amount of preaching to the people would be as persuasive concerning Jesus' identity and purpose as the way he died and the miracle of his arising back to life would. Now verse 10 goes on to say, And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Many times we see somebody and the crowds are around and we don't know who they are. And we ask that same question, who is this, not knowing who they are. Sometimes they may not be recognizable, sometimes they are. But the Jewish pilgrims who found lodging outside the city for the holiday would walk into the city each day of the week-long celebration. But on this day, many such pilgrims accompanied Jesus into the city. And the commotion was so great that the whole city was moved. Now the question of the day was not what's happening, but who is this, as scripture points out. That question is profound and has lasting consequences for faith and discipleship. In order to give his disciples greater insight into his identity, Jesus had asked them who people say that he was in Matthew 16. The disciples mentioned various prophets such as Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the others. But when Jesus asked them, who do you believe that I am? Peter confessed and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But even though Peter said that, he didn't understand what that meant or how dangerous this confession would prove to be. Still, Jesus declared that on the truth of this great confession, the church would be built. Only by accepting Jesus as, his disclose, as, as he disclosed himself, not just as a prophet or a teacher, but as a Savior and Messiah, can a, true, a person truly follow Jesus and the church remain faithful to him. As we start our close in verse 11, so the multitude says, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, despite the previous acclamations of Jesus as the son of David, the crowd gave a somewhat tamer answer to the question of Matthew 21, verse 10 that we just talked about. The crowd identified him by name as Jesus and by his hometown of Nazareth in Galilee and by special vocation as a prophet. But there is no language of Jesus as Messiah or King. But even so, the designation of Jesus as a prophet seems to have had a powerful impact on the city. It is the reason that Jewish leaders plotted carefully and secretively to have Jesus arrested. In verse 46 down below in Matthew 21, they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitudes because they took him also as a prophet. Many joined Jesus' parade to Jerusalem, and when the crowd cheered, many were caught up in the spirit of the celebration. But Jesus deserved their praise, even though many didn't really know who he really was. But we must not forget, Jesus was headed to the cross. This was just the beginning. All of us experience great happiness, but we also experience sorrow, pain, betrayal, and loss as well, just as Jesus did. This is not an ex exception to a good life. It is the fact of living in the world marred by sin. Growing in our knowledge of Jesus and our relationship with him helps us to choose to follow his lead every day. Our preparation for extraordinary struggles began in ordinary preparation. Spending time in the word and in prayer 
seeking the Spirit's guidance, and worshiping with the body of Christ, serving our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, and our enemies. But during this time, may we celebrate Jesus in all circumstance and follow him no matter where it leads. And our final thought to remember is whatever you know of him, seek to know him better. I hope you got some insight out of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as we begin the Passion Week, as we celebrate that, remembering the things that Jesus did. I just pray today that if someone's not a follower of Christ, that you may understand why he came. He came to save us from our sins, sins that started back in the Garden of Eden. Even through the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices only covered the blood, but they couldn't save us. Or they covered the sins. The blood of the animals covered the sin. Jesus came to give his life that we may have eternal life with him forever. If you haven't made that decision, my prayer is that you will follow him today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word together. As we reflect back on the beginning of the Passion Week, when Jesus rode into the city knowing what was ahead, he still came of his own free will, knowing the task that had to be done and the things that he would have to go through, but knowing the importance that it was the only way for us to get back to you. I just pray today for those who may not know and understand, just pray today that your spirit will touch their hearts and help them understand what the death, the burial, and resurrection was all about. That God loves us so much that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. And I just pray today, Father, that if there's someone out there listening that doesn't know you, they'll come to know you today. Thank you for loving us and for the opportunity to serve you. And we just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, we'll finish up with the Resurrection Sunday. I hope you have a blessed week.